Hello again. We're here with you with GPS again today. And uh, thank you for being with us, and we're excited. We're doing Revelation. You know that. I'm hoping you're part of our faithful followers now, and you look forward to getting a Bible out and doing Revelation. We are blessed. I am blessed to be with John Pauline, mm -hmm. a, a scholar of Revelation, and we just, we just uh, delight in this time to take another level. And, and I just have to confess, we had agreed that we would take the next show, would be Revelation 6, and we're going to do Revelation 6. Get your Bible out. But there was a nugget, John, that just has to be out there for everyone. Uh, we were talking about sanctuary last time, and the, the undergirding of the whole book of Revelation has sanctuary in it. And you talked about 15 uh, references in Revelation 5. You listed quite a number of them. And then you said the first half of the book roughly deals with the daily, the tami, the daily sacrificial system, mm -hmm. and the second half on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Great stuff. And then you said, off camera, you said uh, it really has the whole seven festival system is in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. We cannot have that among the three of us and not the rest of the world. So yeah. just take a minute. We're not going to follow up. We're not going to take you away from Revelation 6 eventually, yeah. but no, we have I, to have that. I think a lot of scholars have, have come to see that as you go through the book of Revelation section by section, it points to different feasts. Uh, Passover is connected with the seven churches. A Pentecost connected with, uh, you know, Revelation, the seal. And seals. you do the seven feasts by memory, just to give everyone who doesn't know what we're talking about? Well, the, you have Passover, you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, if you want to go with, uh, with that as well. Pentecost, uh, then you have uh, Day of Atonement, you Trumpet. have Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and then Feast of Tabernacles. And for the Jews, uh, you also have uh, Purim, which is, uh, and, and Hanukkah. From uh, so, you know, there you would have uh, seven feasts if you want to go with that. But biblically, there are five main feasts, two in the spring and uh, three is in the fall. Is that right? The seven includes Purim and Hanukkah? Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, I, uh, yeah. Okay, I didn't know that either. Yeah. Well, Passover and unleavened bread are kind of aspects of the same feast. Uh, unleavened bread is at the, you know, the, as part of it. And those feasts were every year, First fruits. the Hebrew cycle. Right from Passover to the end, yeah. every year, every year. Every and so the book of Revelation seems to go through the same cycle where it finally ends up where you have the Feast of Tabernacles uh, is, uh, you know, the peace of eternity. And or it says the Hebrew tabernacle with us. Yeah. I mean, that ties uh -huh. all that together in Revelation 22. Yeah. Uh, now, you mentioned a couple of them there at the beginning, so just refer those again. Where, now, when we were studying uh, Revelation 4, trying to put it in a place, you tied that yeah. to Pentecost. Well, you've got uh, multiple references to Exodus 19, which is Mount Sinai, where God is uh, calling you know, the people, there to be a with people. The people, giving the Ten Commandments, etc. And the, uh, the giving of the Ten Commandments was 50 days after the Exodus, after the Passover, going through the Red Sea. So Pentecost is 50 days after the Passover. Passover. So the day when Jesus is enthroned in heaven is the day of Pentecost, which is also the day that the Holy Spirit is poured out on earth. And in Revelation 5, 6, it even says that uh, the slain lamb has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Hmm. So right there, hmm. the moment when Jesus joins God on the throne and takes hold of this scroll is the moment of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit sent down to the earth, and uh, now we have a new era beginning. So that all supports the idea that chapter 5 of Revelation is grounded in the ascension of Jesus and his enthronement in heaven. One more sanctuary piece is that uh, some scholars feel that Revelation 4 and 5 is Day of Atonement. I've been saying, no, it's the second half of the book. And uh, so just really quickly, why not? If chapter 5 were Day of Atonement, instead of a lamb, you'd have a male goat, wouldn't you? Because the, the unique animal of the Day of Atonement is the male goat. Yeah, and yeah. then we'd all be singing, worthy is the goat that was slain. Oh, no. <laughs> you see? Oh, no. But that's not what John chose. <laughs> Um, if this were Day of Atonement, you would have most holy place language. But there's no Ark of the Covenant, and the Greek word naos is missing. Uh, you have all of that in chapter 11, verse 19. In the naos, you have 
uh, which is the most holy place, you have the Ark of the Covenant. So that language is missing in chapters 4 and 5. There's no language of judgment. You know, Day of Atonement usually is associated with judgment. Not a single word for judgment in chapters 4 and 5. In fact, when you get to the fifth seal, people are complaining, how long will you not be judging? Mm. Mm. So judgment has not uh, happened uh, in, uh, in chapter 5. Very good. So this, this, this all leads me to believe chapter 4 and 5 is the inauguration of the heavenly sanctuary. It begins its ministry during the Christian era there in uh, AD 31. Passover is the lamb motif? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's also the lamp, you know, you, you light the candles uh, mm -hmm. for Passover and so on. Uh, scholars have worked this out long before I was, I was at it. Is there a... I don't buy every detail of it, but as I've gone through, I think the, the larger picture is substantive. Is there a, a succinct summary of this anywhere, or is this going to be in your commentary? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in, in my commentary... I think it's in chapter one, which people can view online at uh, thebattleofarmageddon.com. Uh, and uh, I think there's what I call a, a digression or an excursus. When you run into the candlestick, that's when I kind of review all this sanctuary stuff in a, in a okay, nutshell okay, there. Okay. In my book, The Deep Things of God, there's also uh, a chapter on, on uh, some of this sanctuary imagery. Yeah. I asked you at the last time, uh, you know, does John see all this and intentionally put all these constructs in? Mm -hmm. Because you've talked to us before about chiastic structure. Mm -hmm. So you got to be pretty heady now to write all this down. Okay, I will put all this in a chiastic structure and I will put the sanctuary whole master plan in here. Uh, is this all intentional or is this in the mind of God and we're lucky to find it 2,000 years later? Or did John really kind of have a a script here, and I got to get this in, got to get chiastic structure. What do you think, Hall? Well, when it comes to the chiastic structure, a lot of that is just natural. I mean, uh, when we're thinking today's world, it's A plus B equals C. 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 Okay, so C is the, is the sum of those two interacting with each other. In chiastic thinking, A plus B equals A. And you might say, that's crazy. Well, it's not Greek, it's not Western, therefore it's crazy. Okay. <laughs> However, if you ever sat down at a piano, you have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, a. and then it goes back to A again. Mm -hmm. But now it's enhanced. There's more vibrations as you go up the scale. Oh, John, you very see? good, very good. And so um, with chiasm, it's A plus B equals A, but it's not the same A. It's an A that's been enhanced. It's just a way of thinking. Well, we talk of cycles, you yeah. know, creation and new creation and new words. It's a way of thinking. A yeah, a Hebrew way of thinking. And, and because John thinks that way, A, God gives him a vision that fits, and B, John puts it together whether he was thinking about it or not. Yeah. This is the way that he thinks. Well, let's just kind of pledge to ourselves. I don't know if we're going to make uh, 500 shows on Revelation or what. <laughs> this is 42, I think, and we're five chapters in. But uh, let's remember to bring the sanctuary motif back when we can, mm -hmm. you know, and where you say, I think we're here. We're at this festival or we're here. At the introduction of each of the visions in Revelation, the sanctuary will come back and we can yeah. review so let's, some let's, of these let's things. Let's make a little mm -hmm. trigger, trigger to ourselves to do that. Yeah. Now chapter 6. Please, if you haven't already, got to get a Bible out or get your phone or an iPad or something. And uh, let's read a couple, three verses to get started. And then, uh, John, help us link, link chapters 5 to 6. Why don't, why don't you read the first eight verses? Should we do that six? together? I think they all kind of uh, uh, I'll work start, together. and Sarah, you'll pick it up in verse 3. Sure. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals, and then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. John, what, what translation is that? NIV, NIV. It? sound the same as mine. NIV, okay. No, that was, that the was... Bible in my car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that's, uh, that's good. I, 
you know, remembering the Greek, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there were nuances there that you don't often see. I'll pick it up from verse 5. Yeah, verse 5. And when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. So these are the four horsemen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we, uh, the football has their four horsemen, and I probably knew about the football four horsemen before I knew <laughs> about the ones in the Bible. But uh, here we have the seal. So now, just to give perspective, we have the seven churches. In between, we did Revelation 4 and 5. Now we have seven seals. We will then go to seven trumpets, and then eventually... Mm -hmm. Seven plagues. Those are the ones people are the most familiar with. Why are the seven seals right here in our big sweep of things? Where, where would you think this fits in? So we keep the big picture in our mind. We have no whiteboard here. You have to do it by words mm -hmm. and describing yeah. it. What? What? Why do you think they're right here? Why would anyone You're, put them here? You could see by the looking he was going to do this I to you, knew, didn't you? <laughs> I knew he was going to do this, and I was about to be like, well, you're the smart one. I'm just along for the ride. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, All right. He's laying it on. <laughs> <laughs> he handed it to you. Let's mm -hmm. see what you do with it. I mean, you know, maybe people... I don't know. I'm all about rhythms and reading, and sometimes I think it takes people aback, and so it like kind of mm -hmm. introduces a new aspect and like helps people stay intrigued in something. So for me... It kind of hiccups, like it went from what I would expect Revelation to say to something kind of crazy to catch my attention again. So I don't know. There's no deep theological reason for it in my... Are you okay. glad we didn't ask you this before but what, ordination? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but what do you notice here? What do each one of these start with? You know, I love oh, one and come. three. <laughs> yeah, but, but what happens next? Horses? What are you referring to? Well, what, what happens next is, is when the lamb Opened. broke one of the seven seals, mm -hmm. then four living creatures said, come. Now, where's that all from? Revelation. That's chapter 5. Mm -hmm. 5 and the you seal, see? the, the, the scroll with the seven seals that couldn't be broken. Yeah, couldn't so broken. this is here where it is because it's the continuation of chapter 5. Well, the one who is worthy to open them is a lamb. Now he's going to open them. The scroll is first of it, you know, there on the throne. Lamb comes up, takes the scroll. Everybody cheers, and now he starts breaking them, and stuff happens. Cool. So the next question is, is it in heaven or on earth? Where, where was the lamb on the throne, heaven or earth? In heaven. That was in heaven, okay. Mm -hmm. But what these events here, are they happening in heaven or on earth? I'll say on earth. Okay. So what does that tell us? The writer was given power to take peace from the earth and make men slay each other. Sounds like it's down here. Mm -hmm. Right. So chapter 6 show the consequences on earth of something that happened up in heaven. And uh, among other things, it tells us that uh, heaven and earth are intimately related. Mm -hmm. We may not realize that when we're so very tied into the stuff that's going on around here on the earth. But... Uh, What's happening here on earth is to some degree triggered by what happens up in heaven. Is there any link between seals and sealing? So we're all going up with the, there's going to be sealings here at the end of time. Yeah. And don't do anything, don't harm anything, and rebel in trumpets, don't harm us until we seal. But is one there any person, connection between this or is there no connection? One person uh, once told me, you know, the exegesis is not that important. And I said, well... But if you don't do it, you won't realize that the seven seals are not aquatic animals. Ah, uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, see? Womp, womp. Womp, womp, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, uh, the corn is strong in him, is that yes, what the young people yes, say? Yeah. Anyway, true. So, <laughs> as long as she's the goddaughter, being the one saying it to yeah. you, I'll, 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 I'll handle that part. Sure. Oh, man. But here's, here's the, uh, the next question. If, 
if you get into the story, you know, and Sarah, you're, you're often saying, what difference does it make? Well, for one thing, we all like a good story. Right. And uh, as you get into the story, he's breaking the seals on what? On a scroll. scroll. On a scroll. Is he revealing the content of the scroll or not? Not yet. Why not? Well, he hasn't broken them all yet, so you can't open okay. it. Okay. So if the seals are on the outside, you can't see any of the book until you've broken all seven. Mm -hmm. And because it's a scroll, you have then to. what's happening in chapter 6 is not the content of the book. It's a but it's the events that lead up to revealing the content of the book. I have to ponder that. Well, I think because it's the consequences of even opening the book, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't know, it's a movie. So, you know, he opens one seal and then something happens even though no one knows what's in it yet. It's like he's unleashing the beasts, if you will. Well, our, our good friend Sigva Tonstadt would say that <clears throat> with the opening of this book, God's plan is complete. Satan will be defeated. And, and God's character vindicated. So who would not want the book to be opened up? People that don't want God. The people who are going to suffer the seals. Or Satan, particularly, mm -hmm. you see. Yeah. So uh, he would say that chapter 6 is a chronicle of Satan's actions to resist the fulfillment of God's plan. And so you see all this chaos on earth. That, that is part of Satan's resistance. To, to the plan of God to open this book and reveal Rather than everything. locating these as acts of God. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty big distinction. It is. And, and he and I have sometimes uh, had some battles over that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's uh, keep that yeah. issue in mind as we yeah. go through this. Mm -hmm. uh, but the two are not necessarily contradictory. Because, really because often in Revelation, you'll have a bad character, and it says he was given authority over the earth. Uh, here in, in verse 8, wasn't it? I looked in there, an ashen horse, he who sat on it was named Death. That doesn't sound like something God wants. <laughs> and hell was following him, Hades was following him. This doesn't sound like a good character. Doesn't sound like someone we want living next door. And authority was given to him over a force of the earth. Who gave him that authority? God. Well, in Jewish thinking, Jews often used the passive to talk about God because they didn't want to name God. God is so right. sacred, so beautiful. They didn't want to name God. And so instead of saying God, uh, or certainly not Yahweh, uh, they said, well, you know, uh, may it be good, you know, or, <laughs> or it went well or something, meaning God arranged it, but without actually naming God. It was given to him authority. By who? Clearly by God. Although occasionally the authority is from Satan. You know, Satan delegates As authority. As a parallel to yeah. the dragon giving power and authority to the beast later right. on. Yeah, so the dragon gives authority to the beast, but the beast's authority was given by God as well. So God sometimes takes responsibility for things that he wouldn't ideally choose to do. Sure, we'll have to come back to that before yeah. this is all done. Now, when I sat in school, this is the story I think I probably told the very first show, is that I sat in Pacific Union College Revelation class 40 years ago. And as they began to read these verses and then say this was fulfilled by tribes who came down and destroyed Rome, I would look up at the blackboard and where in the world did he get that? Is that where we're headed here? Is that these are, these are things of 1,800, 2,000 years ago of tribes of Rome and Muslims and Saracens and Turks and ancient history lessons? Or are we uh, still on the backside of this and we're looking forward and we're guessing what will come in the future here? Some of all the above, uh, where should we begin to point people here? Or can you... I suppose in the words of Jesus, I have many things to tell you, but you're not ready. <laughs> not ready yet. <laughs> oh, no. I was going to say, when are we going to get to that issue, yeah. or do we want to dive into the first one and no, read think, and begin to go and then figure it out as we go? Yeah, I think, no, I think uh, seriously we need to understand the text before we apply the text. 
I think one of the dangers, uh, as you may be aware, uh, for more than a thousand years, most Bible commentators read these texts historically. In other words, they saw them as, as pointers to actions of God in history and actions of nations and so forth. And I think that's essentially correct. But what often happened is people would apply things to history before they'd studied the text. And I, I can think of one famous commentator on uh, the seven trumpets. The entire commentary is in quotation marks <laughs> and not one reference to the text. The text is quoted and then history. And this is, I think, what you're talking about. And, 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 and you're kind of like, huh? Well, I, I have a guy that was at my small group last night. I mean, he is incessant and, and he's a nice guy. I'm not trying to be upset with him. But he wants to fit 9-11 and uh, the destruction in, in New York into a prophetic scheme somewhere, Daniel 11, someplace. Mm -hmm. And he just won't let it go. And he wants me to take weeks and weeks of preaching and studying on it because that's what people do. They take these verses and read it in light of what's going on in their world. We come along way later and I said, I'm not an expert on what the tribes did to Rome on the French Revolution. And I say, is that really what we're supposed to spend our time doing? This is what the revelation, this is the revealing that God has given to us, is some insight about tribes of 1,800 years ago? Or are we talking about cosmic God issues here at the end of the world, or both? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to keep that question in our viewers' minds as we go through mm -hmm. it. Are we ready to read the first one and begin to, to go? Are there other introductory things we well, need to cover? I, I would like to uh, get into the, the Old Testament background a little bit of as seals. well, of the seals. But first of all, let me just say that you've got four horsemen. The first four seals reveal horses, but then suddenly it shifts. And the fifth seal, it souls under the altar. And then the sixth seal, you have these heavenly signs. So uh, first of all, there's sort of a four plus two kind of a thing. And then the seventh seal is way off in another part of the book. So it's four plus two plus one. Same thing happens in the trumpets. The trumpets yeah. uh, so that's a pattern we want to notice. So these four horsemen are kind of a unit. And in a real sense, it reminds me, this three-part thing reminds me of uh, Matthew 24. Because in Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the realities of the Christian age. Then he goes to persecutions. And then he goes to heavenly signs. So the pattern of Revelation 6 is the same as Matthew 24. Interesting. So Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Jesus gives his end time sermon. Revelation 6 is the Olivet Discourse of the book of Revelation. It's the place where Jesus gives this eschatological sermon. To ask my common question, is that intentional by the writer or because they're covering common material, it just comes out that way because we're talking about the same last day sequence? I used to be pretty sure of that, <laughs> uh, that uh, Revelation 6 was intentionally building on Matthew 24. But then I did a doctoral seminar had like five or six doctoral students, and I said, okay, this quarter, we're just gonna be studying this one chapter, Matthew 24, and its relationship to Revelation 6. Good, good. So we're gonna do papers on the content of these oh. and then, then connecting the two. And I was surprised at how weak it was. Hmm. It was more thematic than verbal. So I would say, I think there's definitely a connection between them. Was it intentional on John's part? I think the evidence falls short of certainty. Hmm. Is that, are you that's okay very, with that very, answer? Yeah. Your generation okay with that answer? I don't think my, gen like unfortunately, every time my generation of at least my friends, I can't speak for everyone, I will mm -hmm. clarify, but I know there just a pamphlet just came out on like one of the horsemen mm -hmm. and every person <laughs> my age that I was around that saw it went, ugh. <laughs> so I'm not sure that my generation's the one you should gauge. <laughs> so you're saying this is not the chapter we want to start with. Right, well, because here's the thing is, is like I'm all for a good story and all for a good conspiracy theory and all for like the, the visual stimulation that's here just with these mm -hmm. horses. Like I'm picturing it in my head and it's epic and crazy and I mm -hmm. want to know what's about to happen. But then I think 
sometimes we go just the wrong way of explaining what's about to happen, and we we just mess up the entire story. Why wouldn't the video game and the media generation love it? Because there's Matrix and Lord of the Rings and games and Avatar and many, 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 many movies that have this kind of stuff in it. Why wouldn't they say, okay, I finally got a war and battle and some crazy figures here, and why not, okay, this is, resonates with me. Because I think what is a huge turnoff to at least my group of friends is when people try to lord things over you. So if, if I feel like I'm being manipulated in a conversation or like told that this is the only answer and I'm not allowed to like think So it's through. the interpretation and, uh, and we're gonna tell you what it means. Yeah. What if they just had it on the surface on their own and said, now what do you think this means? Would that become better? I think that there would be more of an experience for sure and I think people would buy into it a little bit more. I think that just for so long, especially unfortunately, within the system that I grew up in, it was always, here's the right answer. It was never like, can you quote this back to me? So if I buy all your friends in the Philippines lunch <laughs> and say, here's this passage, why I have no idea what it means. What does it mean to you? <laughs> that would be, that would come up different. Well, I think that it would give them an option to actually have free, free dialogue. Because I think it's scary to ask questions or to challenge things if you're not a super scholar in ancient literature and know Greek mm -hmm. well enough to be able to read it in the original language. You're not going to question That's how the original people heard it when sitting in a house church. They heard someone read right. it and they said, what does that mean? And began but, to think about but it. But again, a lot of this stuff is symbolic within their culture. So, I mean, he, you just said it in, I think, the last episode talking about the sanctuary pieces are well known to them. They're not well known to me. Like, mm -hmm. I don't. I don't have candlesticks by entryways, you know? <laughs> like, that's just poor planning in my mind, but you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a, different, it's a different style for sure, and it's harder to... Well, we'll get into this uh, a, a bit more uh, next time, but just go to Leviticus 26. And uh, I just wanna read a passage there in the light of the four horses that we just read and see if this doesn't sound familiar. If then you act as, Leviticus 26, 21, if then you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. Get that seven? Mm -hmm. And I will let loose among you the beasts of the field which will bereave you of your children and destroy your cattle and reduce your numbers so that your roads lie deserted. And if by these things you're not turned to me, but act with hostility against me, then I will act with hostility against you, and I will strike you seven times for your sins. I'll also bring upon you a sword which will execute vengeance for the covenant. And when you gather together into your cities, I'll send a pestilence among you so that you'll be delivered into enemy hands. When I break your staff of bread, 10 women will bake your bread in one oven, hmm. and you'll bring back your bread in rationed amounts so that you will eat and not be satisfied. I mean, there's no question that if you read Revelation 6 without ever reading Leviticus 26, you're not even close to what this is all about. And so as we continue in chapter 6, uh, we'll want to continue making these connections. And I think that's where people can benefit from having that connecting point, showing people how to read the scripture, the text. I got to end with that. Yeah. The clock says it's time to go. Great stuff. I'm excited. I've loved uh, The Four Horsemen. I love talking about it. I'm glad for your background on it, John. So come back to us next week. We will go into high gear with the seven uh, seals. We'll look forward to having you. God bless.